Okay, my friend. Um, are you still in LA? I am. Because I live here now. I've been here for like two and a half years. Yeah, I, see, I didn't know you were such a Brooklynite for a long time. I didn't know if you were kind yeah. of, uh, you were in a position to sort of, uh, you know, hold two residences like in two, like, you know, big places like that. Uh, I've been to LA. Well, I used to come to LA like three or four times a year when I lived in Brooklyn. Yeah. But eventually, you know, there was no songwriters left in New York because it became so expensive that uh, I was really just the only one left. So I was like, yeah. well, I guess I'll probably move. Uh, comparatively uh, price wise, like between Brooklyn and where you are in LA, is there is it is there a vast difference in pricing for housing? A little bit, but yeah. the, uh, it's getting worse in LA. It's getting more expensive. Uh, but originally when I moved, you know, like the money that you save on cheaper rent in LA and more space, you spend on a car and it maybe in LA, you can Uber around and there's a lot of people yeah. do, but I, you know, you need a car to get for me to be a lot. It's, it's not really a city. Yeah. Have you had that classic, uh, 405, uh, traffic jam, uh, yeah, so that cliche? Yeah, that's why I have my studio at my house because I don't yeah. have to go anywhere. Yeah, drive from where I live to Venice Beach. It's like, it's only sixteen miles, and it it can take two hours. Wow. Yeah. So in I know you've been up to Toronto a few times. We have this saying that uh, to get from Toronto to Toronto on the four hundred one, our our famous highway, is an hour. <laughs> so we all, I think I think LA has got a similar thing to get. I guess to get from three eggs. To, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Double of it. Um, anyway, I'll dive right into it. This is this is a bit of a fanboy interview. I've, I have to admit, I won't be able to stay 100% objective, but I will try and remain professional at all times. That's my favorite. <laughs> okay, great, good. So, if you want to get say nice things, and I appreciate that. So I'm, I'm your age. I'm uh, You're a few months older than I am. We're both 35. You were uh, 28th of February. I'm tw- What's that? So I'm just 1036, but somehow my age got out there on the internet. I tried to keep it a secret for so long, and somehow oh, really? it ended up on Wikipedia, and I don't know how recently, and I'm like, damn it, it's the secret's out. No, well, I've never really given my age away, because it just, I remember like, and it wasn't for any particular reason, it's yeah. just, I remember years and years ago, someone came up to me and said, how old are you? And I was like, how old do you think I am? Yeah. He's like, well, no, we've been looking everywhere on the internet, and we can't find it. And I was oh. like, oh, that's good to know. So I, yeah, for some reason, it just became this thing, this funny game where I was like, never would reveal my age. Oh. It I'm not, I don't care. It's not like I'm embarrassed. In age yeah, age, yeah. It just became this sort of game. See, that's funny that somebody would say I've spent all this time needing to know this. Really, how old I am? Yeah, just to need to need this detail about you. What would you say if I told you that you don't sound like Mumford and Sons, Frank Turner, or Tom Petty, and that you actually sound like yourself? I would really appreciate it because those comparisons come in all the time, and I get so. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It's nice to be compared to people like that, but yeah, yeah. The day, like I'm not trying to sound like anybody like that, and and I just I always feel like because I used to get back in the day, it used to be like, oh my god, you sound so much like Damien Rice, and it's like why? Because I'm a white guy with a guitar. Like that's <laughs> literally the only thing that's similar. Um, and for me, that's always like I don't know. I have a love hate relationship with comparison because I try not to compare people to anything, and I don't like being compared to people either. Because yeah. I think music is is subjective. It's your own thing. It's I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's. Uh, I appreciate it is what I'm trying to say to you. Yeah, well, no, you're you. very welcome. And I just. I don't really understand. You know, if you were just going to look at the. Like, I don't know when did four. When did four on the floor kick drums with harmonies become automatically Mumford and Sons? You know, I didn't. I never it's understood so, the comparison so, at all. I love the Pogues. I love Flogging Molly. Yeah. I, I love. Like, I'm just like, why did Mumford and Sons? Nothing against Mumford. No, and no, no, like, no, 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 not at all. When, Crowned as like the inventors of this music that's been around for like four years, you know, it was just for yeah. me that was kind of like, all right, I get it. It's like, but it's like saying that Coldplay started like delay, delay guitar stuff, you know, yeah. like <laughs> YouTube were already around for twenty years before yeah. that. Like, I don't know. I like I like Mumford and Sons. I think that Marcus Mumford is is, is a really really talented guy, and I have nothing against that band. No, and I, I don't think it's, I don't think there's anything to say that it shouldn't be an insult to say that you don't sound like somebody. I just thought like four on the floor kick drums with deep harmonies, and I'm 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 kind of refer, referring to to home as a song, and and like you know just because you wrote a pattern that has been done a thousand times. Uh, it doesn't, yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have ownership over that style. No, for sure. Uh, I agree with. You. I, I didn't. I like aggressive sounds. I like fast yeah. music. I like playing 
guitar really, really quickly, you know, and yeah. like all that stuff in that Mumford and Sons esque <laughs> uh, acoustic guitar rhythm stuff. But like, you know, I, I so so do so many other people. It's the ownership of things, like ownership of style, ownership yeah. of. Well, uh, Compared to what you know, right? My my friend Steve and I, uh, Steve is a singer-songwriter in Nashville. Uh, his name is Steve Rivers. I don't see him much anymore. So when we do talk, we uh, we talk about what we're listening to. And you're a, you're an artist that we both share a strong affinity towards. I mean, I was very excited about the interview. We thought, you know what makes you unique for most songwriters is that you have you have an affinity for incredibly melodic verses. Oh, and I don't know if that's something that naturally comes to you or if it's something that you do put focus on. Well, I think that if you go back and listen to my old record, if you go back and listen to my old catalog. My um, old stuff. I think that it's a little less like that. But in, since Home Happened and since I've sort of been doing because I write, you know, I do now too. And a lot of that is you, what you do have to think about, like the hookiness of verses and choruses because you have to really pull people in in pop music. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think that, especially on the new record, and probably the last one as well, Chase the Sun, uh, yeah. I definitely was thinking more in terms of pop, uh, in terms of melodies, you know? Yeah. No, but I think that I haven't changed that much. Like, I'm still singing about the most depressing shit I can think about. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, the melodies have definitely become more poppy, only because I'm in the pop industry now a little bit more. Right. No, I'm not full-time in it because I don't enjoy it as much as some do. I find it a little bit soul destroying sometimes. Yeah. And I also I don't really enjoy writing songs for other people as much as uh, I like writing for myself because I feel like it's still I still have a voice and I still want to uh, right. Well, I just feel more comfortable writing in my own voice. It's hard for me to sometimes get yeah. in someone else's head. A lot of people I know they sort of start with their their choruses, right? Like they'll come up with their hook and, and they'll say, you know, oh, I've got this incredible idea. Some of the really great songs can their verses can suffer and i mean i'm, I'm hard pressed for an example right off the t- tip of my tongue but i've always noticed that i especially tom petty. yeah oh, perfect i was gonna say a lot of tom petty there and I, I find myself singing your verses as much as i would sing a chorus and i i find that to be one of the most unique things about your songwriting so i'm, I'm glad it comes naturally i mean yeah, i'm conscious of but it's also like i don't really think I mean, probably more these days, but less years ago. I don't think in terms of like traditional song structures, like yeah. it has to be this, and it has to be that, and then it has to go into this. Like if you listen to my, you know, three biggest songs, Home, The Lost Boy, and Boys in the Street. Yeah. Like none of those, literally none of those songs have a chorus. Right. Yeah. Like, um, so they're not, it, I don't really think like, oh, well, this is the chorus and these are the verses. And I just sort of, just keep going <laughs> yeah. with those yeah. with those songs in particular. Don't get me wrong. I do try and, you know, structure a song in a pop sense and get the pre-chorus melody and the yeah. chorus yeah. Me- melody all sort of defined. But in the ones that have done best in my career, interestingly, are the ones where I haven't really thought about that. I remember when I first heard Hold On Tight on the radio. So I remember where I was, what I was doing, the vehicle I was driving, and how angry I was that, that because it was a Dodge Caravan, the volume only went up so loud. So for me, it's like you have these unbelievably catchy songs. And when I do my research on this, I find that some of these songs, like Lost Boys, came to you in the middle of the night and you picked up and then you wrote it. And other songs that have been these successes for you have been like 30 minutes or less. Yeah, I mean, I wrote Boys in the Street in 15, 20 minutes. The fact that a song like that comes out of you, and I, I'm still in the middle of writing like my fourth song ever, I think. I think it's about quarter after 17 years that I'm still waiting for that song, you know? <laughs> Don't get me wrong, that doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. Uh, I've, labored, I've labored over songs for months, and weeks, days, whatever. Like, There's only a few that have come out like that. But you know what's interesting is that the ones that have come out like that have been my most successful. So I really wish that I could figure out how to channel that because The Lost Boy, I wrote, like I said in an interview previously, like in my sleep. Yeah. I woke up the night and it, I had it in my head it was like someone gave it to me almost in July of last year you wrote what I feel and other people feel was maybe the the best guitar based song of the year and that was with On The Run and the official video also features Butch Walker someone I'm, I'm hoping to ask you a little bit more about in a second was that a middle of the night song or an under 30 minute song or was was On The Run because 
again, catchy verses and kind of like a double chorus or, or pre-chorus chorus, an interesting structure as well. Sonically very different than the acoustic bass stuff. So I was wondering like, if you could walk me through that song from, from its inception to its, uh, its final product, because that to me is a, is, a, is a masterpiece of a recording and a phenomenal song. Um, that song was like a, a day's work. Like I was okay. you know, sitting at home in LA, uh, and I sort of started working on this track. But in in the beginning, was sort of meant to be like, more like a Fleetwood Mac vibe. Yeah, okay. Um, it had all these sort of guitar riffs on there and stuff. Yeah. But that song, I just I, I don't know why I don't know where it came from. I just wanted to. I mean, I always tell people in interviews that that song is an apology to anybody that you know stepped on in the past trying to get where I want to be not that I've ever maliciously ever, no no yeah you know what's funny is I wasn't thinking about that when I wrote it it was just sort of coming out and then later on when I st- first started doing press for that song I was like oh shit I need to <laughs> I, need to, I need to figure out what I'm going to say about this song and yeah. what, I'm gonna, what's, what I'm going to say that it's about because I don't actually know if I know the answer so I listened to it a few times and then realized that that's probably probably what it's about <laughs> but not entirely sure so anyway I recorded a demo of it uh myself and then i took it to butch and he was like this sounds awesome let's just uh get a band in a room and we'll we'll just track it live and see what comes out so that's what oh we did. wow we recorded that song in a three takes i think holy well i mean if the the official video is cool to see because like if anyone who follows you on social media and stuff knows the important relationship of you and butch and yeah and how much he means to you and stuff and to watch the video uh and i i've from everyone i've personally know that have shot a music video which isn't many people and other people that uh, i'm fans of that also are part of the music video process don't like it and it seemed like you guys were actually having a pretty good time in that room well don't like the video don't like shooting videos oh i hate shooting videos yeah i I feel like it's a common thread yeah we had a good time though um we did record it in that room like that that was my Uh, next question actually was i was gonna ask that we recorded it in that room with that band uh, not on that particular day, we did right. recreate it to look like we did that. But it's really difficult to actually record, a, like record record while it's being filmed. Sure. If you want the filming to look good, so we sort of had to put that together to look yeah. like that. The sonic landscape of that song really jumps out at me. Like just the use of uh, of, of uh, you know Coldplay guitars. Is that what we're calling it now? Anything with delay is Coldplay guitars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But just the use of a more electric feel and and uh, almost yeah, going for that like uh, Fleetwood Mac sort of lo-fi pick rift um, background to it. Was that yeah, a I mean, conscious conscious decision? We well, yeah, that was Butch. I mean, we all the band is like buddies of mine, but they all now happen to work with Butch on a regular basis. So <laughs> we were all friends, but it was really fun. But that was actually the first song that was recorded for the record that I was supposed to make with Butch Walker. Oh, I was okay. I was supposed to do the entire album with him. Yeah. And that song, sonically, sonically, just, I loved it. Like, I couldn't stop, even though it's my own song, I, I, it was more about the sound of it. I just couldn't stop listening to it because yeah. the minute it you, like, feel good. It does. And, it's it's a great driving song. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that, but, like, it's a fantastic car audio song. Uh, yeah. Maybe not in, not in traffic, but it's a, it's a great song to play in the car. I find it's... Uh, it, it on my Spotify playlist, it's my it's my AM song. So like songs that if, when your when your shoes hit the tarmac or your shoes hit the concrete when you're leaving the house, uh, yeah. it's one of those songs. And and uh, just it, it's a very driving song. And, and honestly, I was it was one of those things where because you can see me, it was one of those things that I was just like, absolutely, like this is this is great. And we've played a lot on the show, and and uh, I've I've pushed it on a lot of people, and. Uh, it, it's phenomenal. Because I know now that the best songs are the ones that come quickly. Like, if I'm laboring over a song for weeks, like, that's never ended well. Or well, not that it's ended badly, but that's never, nothing's ever really come of it. Yeah. I, I think that uh, I've got to sort of remember that a lot of times when I'm banging my head against the wall just to, like, let it go. Yeah. You know, because I'm not precious about songs. Like, I don't really. I have friends who are, who are much better songwriters than I am, and they do it for. They do. They make great livings doing it. Sure. And they they will labor over songs for so long, and then we'll go back and forth on emails. Like, what about this lyric? What about this change? Yeah. Like, I'd love to get in the studio and like fix this thing. And as you know, it's probably not a good thing for me. It's probably why my career is not way better than it should be. 
it's because I'm lazy and I'm like, nah, I feel like it's done. You know? <laughs> and well, if it's not done, it, it's not meant to be. And, and that's probably not the most professional mentality to have and probably isn't the, not the most uh, uh, lucrative mentality right, to have yeah. when it comes to it. But it's just the way that it, my brain works, I guess. I didn't think that like your songs have a have a a, a larger message. It's the, it, like you're not really writing um, uh, the the ballad of Ella Fitzgerald like by Gordon Lightfoot, where it's about a specific boat accident that happened. You know, it's a very like you're very all encompassing and on all welcoming uh, to your music. So I think that there's an there's an honesty about that too. So I I feel like if you were to labor over, uh, you know, like I like like the first line of Hold On Tight. You know, like, I've been selling my name for the sake of who knows. Like, that makes me want to figure out what you're talking about. But at the same time, you're also saying, like, don't take your life for granted. So yeah. I feel like if you had have agonized over the opening line a little bit more, it wouldn't have drawn, drawn me in as much. Or if you were worried about changing it to something more prolific instead of don't take your life for granted, you may have lost me. So I think it's kind of it kind of like um, six in one, half dozen in the other. If you were to take too long on it, maybe it wouldn't have reached the – the 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 right kind of people, or um, it wouldn't have touched people in the way that those songs have have have, have touched. Oh, I mean for sure. Like you know, it's funny is when I've listened back to that song, I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> this doesn't make sense. You know, it's so funny. Like because me and my buddy wrote it when we were having a blast in in the studio in Brooklyn, and yeah, we just were on a you know we were on a wave. We wrote like five songs in like three days or something. Wow. Uh, but it's funny when I look back at that, I'm like, that that doesn't completely makes sense to the chorus but it sounds good oh yeah it sounds, it sounds great like i mean when i have like acoustic shows where i'm playing at a, at a at a coffee house or something like i've played that song and, and had people go like like what f- song is that like, did you write that and i was like no but here's a guy that did and like I, oh actually for instance it's on our set list for saint patrick's day the response that you, you people get from it like it's an instantly catchy song but it's it does you, when you mention you guys having fun in the studio i i immediately smiled because i thought it sounds like it it genuinely sounds like everything you at the piano uh or i guess it almost sounds like a toy piano at the beginning and like even like the drums like the thundering drums and the toms are a little bit loud and and it sounds like guys in the studio having fun yeah it's a tack piano oh is that you what know, it is you put like the little uh tacks on the end of the each piano, yeah. uh, uh, I don't know what they're called inside of a piano, but that's what gives it that sort of jangly sound. Yeah, no, it, it, it's wicked. I remember trying to recreate it for a backing track, uh, and I, did, I, I, I gave up. I said, I can't, I can't mimic the sound. They don't, they don't have a, a garage band plug-in for that yet. For all the reasons that you did uh, quit something, I 100% agree. But you're kind of a few weeks removed from uh, resignation. But how how do you feel about like social media thing or specifically Twitter like now? Any you're still like it's the best thing to quit it. Oh yeah, I'm off Twitter really. Yeah. I mean, my label makes me post things on there because you know it's just it doesn't make any sense not to. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not engaged in it anymore. It's just such a toxic environment. It I is. Don't yeah. That. I mean, I'm not a poster. I'm more of a like I go I go on it for news. But I guess you'd be more subjected to things like comments and criticisms and, and stuff like that and and uh and i just uh, watching people fight man I, oh it, it bums me out and like i just feel like no matter which side you're coming from it's just people yelling at each other and it's just not an environment that i want to be part of yeah and in all i'm like i don't have that much followers that many followers on Twitter anyway so it's not like yeah. it's not life-changing you know no. if i'm not on there it's not it's not affecting my life in any damaging way for me not to be on there so i'm just like why would i be on there because i feel that way with social media in general these days like yeah if i if i could just keep having a career but not be on these things uh, that's what i would do but unfortunately yeah. with the age we're living in if you're not on social media you're not rel- you're not relevant you're not re- alive right there's there's, there's almost no room like there. it's if the if the information about you isn't ex- isn't accessible instantly um then then it doesn't exist. You know, exactly. like if, if I don't know about you through the internet, then you can't be real. Exactly. And I don't like that. For my personal life, I don't like that. Yeah. But for my career, if I, if I quit these things, it's career suicide. So I have to be a part Right, of it. yeah. Unless you're, I, unless you're some sort of uh, superstar where it's like Demi Lovato quits Twitter and then somehow it boosts her users. Like, I don't like... Like 
big a thing. No, for me, it's just, I'd be cutting off my nose to spite my face. Yeah. yeah. Just and, it wouldn't be a, a good idea for me. I, th I think it was just a lot of confusion of people not really understanding how the music industry works. Like, yeah, most pop stars don't write their songs. No. Um, and I would say that goes for about 90% of pop stars. Yeah. Um, and I know that, and people in the industry know that. But yeah. when, uh, with Home, it was a little more complicated because they marketed it on it, American Idol as an original composition. Yeah. Right? So they basically lie to the general public which is fine that's what they do um but there just so happened to be a video of me playing home like yeah. three months before on tour yeah so then tmz and all these gossip magazines like were able to get a hold of this video and then create a story yeah and like and they ended up calling me and being like how do you feel about having a song stolen by American Idol? And I was oh, like, God. well, first of all, they're not allowed to legally use it unless I say yes. Yeah. If you knew anything about the music industry, you would know that I had to approve this. Otherwise, they'd be breaking the law. Yeah. And so TMZ... I got a phone call from American Idol being like, can we use this song? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. And American <laughs> Idol paid for it. my career is going down the toilet and I could use the exposure. Yeah. And American Idol or, or the publishing company would have... Paid for the yeah, song. Yeah, like American Idol called me, you know, but the publishing company called me. Yeah, I know exactly, and and I think that it's almost funny. We you people go to TMZ for news, and a, and a story like this, you TMZ probably I would imagine don't focus on uh, inside, in, not even so much inside, just like regular well, music well, industry knowledge. Well, all they want to know is something they can talk about. I mean, they ask yeah. how much I got paid for it, and the answer is zero because that's not how it works. That's like, right. You, you get paid later from yeah. sales and publishing, but you don't get paid. You don't give one of your songs away and get paid for it. Like, that's just not, that's a, just a complete misunderstanding of how the music industry works. Right. But all they wanted was numbers that they could write down in their article and, you know, gossip that they could create a headline with. And that's, you know, I just didn't want to be a part of any of that. No, no, I mean, of course. And I don't, I also got asked a lot, do I have any regrets about giving home to American Idol? No, it changed my life. Yeah. But, you know, I don't have like I love that that happened to me. It's one of the greatest yeah. things that happened to me in my life. Are you are you tired of talking about home? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but that's that's okay. It's, it's the biggest thing that happened to me in my career. So you know, I'm sure Coldplay is sick of talking about parachutes. You yeah. know, but they or yellow have to because it's the best record they ever made. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but like you know, I know I'm not I'm not sick of talking about it. I'm proud of it. Yeah, but I wish. I kind of wish that something else would happen so that I, I'm not sort of painted into this corner as like the guy that wrote home. Like I'd rather be the guy that wrote a bunch of these songs. But yeah. that's the nature of the industry. People I, focus on the biggest thing that you've done. And that's the biggest thing that I've done. So naturally people want to talk to me about that. And so no, I'm not mad about it. Maybe they wouldn't even want to talk to me if it wasn't for that. So. I was like really impressed and, and in a way sort of inspired that you owned your all your own publishing up as was it right up until the Warner deal? I still own my own publishing, and that to me is remarkable. So we're learning about this stuff in 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 uh, in our in our classes and and everything now. And was that something that you knew before you like before you went out on your own, or, or really decided to pursue uh, a career in music? Did you know that that was important? Because that's kind of seems like a trend that's starting now. But that was you were you were almost a decade ahead of that. I have to give my old manager credit for that. Yeah, he, he was the one. He was the one that from day one was like, well, "You need to retain ownership of your publishing." And so that's his insight. I wanted to sign a publishing deal immediately because I was broke and I just needed money. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't really un have a real understanding of what owning or publishing meant. Like I just wanted, I needed money. Yeah. So I kept doing it. Uh, so no, he was the one who pushed that. So I ended up signing an admin deal with a small publishing company back in the day, and then I've just always had admin deals ever since then. Yeah. Um, because the problem with publishing deals, and I'm not going to speak of all publishing deals. No, 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 no. Yeah. Everything is unique to the each each writer, but there's a usually a quota of songs that you have to not only write every year but yeah. have to get cut. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure. Um, and I don't do well under pressure. And also, I don't write a lot. So, 
you know, I knew that the publishing deal was not for me anyway. And I've been fortunate in my career now that I have a song like Home under my belt that I can pretty much get an admin deal. No right. problem. Yeah. It's opened a door in a way. It has opened many doors. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, uh, I feel grateful that I own my publishing because now I can, well, first of all, I get more of a cut of it. And yeah. Then we get paid. You know, um, but second of all, I can do whatever the hell I want with my sons. And yeah. No one can tell me what to do. In season five of, uh, of Sons of Anarchy, so the episode four, um, and it was like that show was a cult phenomenon. The the funeral of Opie was like, and he's a beloved character of the show takes place, and it's this beautiful montage of characters. And Lost Boy is is the backing of that. So when that came, and, and again, touching base on what we first said before, this is a song you woke up in the middle of the night and wrote in like in kind of one sitting. When you were you aware of the show prior to? No, sorry, were you approached about that, or did you have to? Was your publisher? soliciting your material for you um yes to the latter so that song okay. had already had a life of its own and yeah yeah one single in europe and yeah had, had this whole life but what's funny is i actually wrote home and lost boy in the same week and i wish Jesus. i could go back and remember what i was drinking for week. i was um, just gonna say yeah like where were you moved like i mean that's a, that's a that's a good stretch <laughs> but uh that song i've never i have to admit i've never actually watched sons of anarchy okay uh, and haven't watched Sons of Anarchy since. Yeah. Uh, not for any reason, really. Um, but, no, that was one of those moments where my publisher's job is to put, push my music to film in TV supervisor. Okay. Music supervisor. Yeah. Um, so that was just one of those ones where whatever supervisor was supervising uh, Sons of Anarchy heard The Lost Boy and thought it would be perfect and yeah. threw me a huge fucking solid. No, you know? I mean, it, it's... Um, have you ever seen the clip of it being used? You, like, even though you haven't watched the show, have you seen where it was placed? Yeah, I watched it. It's it's perfect. Like, I mean, yeah. it, it's it's for a lot it's of people. Text for me, but like, because I never watched the show. No, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. From yeah. The from the reaction that I continue to get, I mean, I still get messages about people seeing that in the show, and like, yeah, it, it's clear to me that Op was a very important character in that show, and people yeah. not only fictionally cared about him but somehow became like obsessed with sons of anarchy it's it sort of like seems like this cult show it is yeah so, so I, you know what's funny is when i got that call about because we have to obviously prove every time of course uh, yeah song gets used because i have an admin deal um yeah. <laughs> i obviously i said yes and i was like i don't i've never heard of the show actually but uh, there wasn't a great deal of money for it but i, I don't i don't care about that stuff and uh, they said they would use it in the show. They didn't say that they were going to use it for like, oh. the outro of a, a very important character's funeral, or oh. or, the, or they would because they even made the song longer. Like they they actually edited the song to make it long enough to fit in that entire scene, which was really cool. Because generally the rule goes with with syncs and placements is that like yeah. If it's like a montage and like an over you get a long time, it's a lot better than it just being like a quick thing. When it was out there that your song was featured in a Sons of Anarchy episode, is when I started watching the show. Right. So mine was mine was reversed. Like FX, you actually your participation in that show brought me to that show, and then since I went back and watched it all, and I would say it's like the, one of the top five moments of the the entire show minus like you know the finale episode is always the biggest but uh you know it's a murderous show about bikers so it's not really you know exactly for everybody but um the, but it's interesting my i was wondering if you had seen or if you had to see scenes of the show ahead of time so uh that was no, that was the big part of people it. think that i wrote that song about like fictional motorcycle characters yes you know, honestly it, it fits that well but I wrote the song about Sudanese refugee after I read a book by Dave Beggars. Yeah. You know, so it has nothing to do with bike, but that's all right. I, I'm, I try and write my songs universally yes. enough that people can latch onto it in any way they want without making it so specific that it can only reach a certain audience. Yeah. But for, like, um, it was funny because I, I, I didn't realize how big that sync was until the day after that it aired on that show because Lost Boy like entered the Billboard chart. Yes. Yeah. And like, sold like something like 35,000 copies. Thousand copies, like, yeah. And I was like, what the fuck is happening? And I had to <laughs> go on the internet and check. And then I went on the Lost Boy video on YouTube and like every, there was so many hundreds and hundreds of comments of people being like, 
rest in peace, OP, rest in peace, OP. Oh, OP, really? really? Miss you. And I'm like, who the fuck is OP? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? Because you, so have... you just gave permission for the song to be used. You didn't know the context. Oh, the context? I didn't know anything. Uh, so I was like, who the hell is Opie? I need to, I need to dig into this. <laughs> so then I was found the scene of the, of the funeral. and was like, oh, that's who Opie is. Right. Yeah, I yeah. I think, you, I think you yourself would have to need the, the previous four seasons to understand the context anyways. But I just think that I just couldn't imagine like waking. I'm in my bedroom right now. So like... like can you imagine waking up one day and being like, "There's R- of all names too, like OP. Like it's not like it's like R like R I P, uh, you know, Daniel Smith. It's like yeah. R I P O P. Like whose dog died? I'm like, do they like do they? And then I ended up writing in the comments section a little naively probably, but like saying like, "Hey, I appreciate all the the feedback from the, this song, and I'm really glad that it was used on this new show and it brought new life to the song." But I really want people to know that this song is a true story right. about a yeah. Sudanese refugee linked to this charity. That's because perfect. I didn't want, you know, I wanted to like get exposure to the charity as much as I could in that moment while I was getting all this extra yeah, attention. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if people paid attention to that or not. But, I, but that's how, that you, song ended up taking on a life of its own after being on that show. I'm really grateful for that too. And that was yeah. that was happened that happened sort of the same time as Home was going on too. So I was like, well, this is. Awesome. Yeah, I was gonna say it was kind of like this this double whammy, wasn't it? Because when I look at that time, that timeline, it seems like it's it's pretty close in proximity. When you think about like the life cycle great. of the song, sure. was that? 2012 was a great year. Yeah, no, for sure. And I'm again, I think that you, I I undoubtedly think that that your career will have many more. Um, But I always forget that Greg Wells is Canadian. Oh yeah. Like I, I forget this all the time, and and I would be remiss not to ask you what that. Uh, I mean, the album for me, the album came out phenomenally. I love that record. Um, but what was it like working with him? It was great. You know, we had a. Uh, it was just making Greg basically the whole time. Yeah. He was so insanely talented that he played. Apart from the acoustic guitars, he played every instrument on that record oh, okay did he i didn't know i know you kind of you have got a great like run of collaborative people like your the live bands you've played with and i've and, been very lucky i've yeah. been surrounded by world-class musicians and producers my entire career which is i feel very fortunate for Definitely. and I, I honestly sometimes feel i'm not worthy of but that's a whole other matter um but <laughs> you know great working with greg was uh it was awesome we did it really quick we made that record in like three and a half weeks um just wow. made him in his studio in la yeah that's and I, we have a mutual respect for each other, so there was no like, uh, there's no weirdness for that. Yeah. Uh, one thing is that we're both really, really stubborn, and we both know what we want, so we butted heads a couple of times. Uh, he's probably used to it. I've seen. I, he's worked with a lot of divas. I, I'm sure yeah. you weren't the worst he's ever had. But you know, Greg is Greg is awesome, and he's incredibly talented. He's very self aware. He very much knows how successful he is, and that's really a, a good a good place to be in life. I wish sometimes I could give myself a little bit more credit than I do. Yeah. Um, but we had a great time, uh, and the record came out awesome. No, it, um, it really did. Yeah, I was really happy with that record, and a little disappointed of, you know, its lack of commercial success, but I think that'll just be, that'll always be the case, probably. I think, yeah, I think some of the best art at the time goes, uh, in the contemporary status, goes unappreciated. I mean, you look at, I'm not sure... If it was, was it Blood on the Tracks? Was like, no. My well, favorite Bob Dylan record. Well, here's the thing, right? People, Music has become, I, I don't want to, at the risk of sounding like a crotchety old man, like I, <laughs> I always am really careful about how I speak about this. Sure, because yeah. I'm the older generation now, and like kids and kids these days are doing it the way that they do yeah. it, and that's how it's gone for centuries. Yeah. Um, or let's just say decades. Um, but for me, like, music has become a commodity. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It's, you can listen to all the music you want that ever has been written in the history of time right. for nine, nine a month. That's right. Like, what, I think that people have just gotten so used to music just being this thing that, that is click on. Yeah. You know, no longer do you stand outside the store waiting to go buy the vinyl or whatever. Like, and I don't, 
again, this is not and this is not a dig at the way music is now. It's just no? the reality of the way music is now. And I don't want to sound like an old man, uh, but people don't they don't care about it as much. I don't think. No. And I don't want to say, I don't want to assume that. But at least or at least the, the value of it has been it's been incredibly devalued. And I think yeah. that it's it's become a lot cheaper to make music. It's been become a lot cheaper to release music. Uh, and now there's just such a sheer volume of it that people don't really even consider what has gone into making a record. And a lot of times, people, the musicians don't even put that much effort in anymore because they realize, like, well, we could just do this really easy and really cheap. Let's just fix do that. it after. Yeah, and yeah. you just put it out there because you know that you know you used to spend three years making a record. Well, yeah. not three entire years making the record, but it would be like three years in between releases. Yeah, you would you would have three months of press building up to this release. Um, and then you would put it out, and then it would be like a six-month tour, you know, to promote it. Yeah. And all this, all this stuff. And now there are forty thousand releases every Friday. I remember there was like maybe four CDs that came out, and it was Tuesdays. If you remember, these yeah. new releases were Tuesdays in North America, and you go and an H and B would have that wall, that like new release wall, and but you knew, you know. Uh, uh, there's this record. I'm going here for that record. And you were like, I remember being, I'm sorry to so totally just hijack what you were saying. Like, I remember being so fucking excited to get Oasis's be here now that I was like helping the, the store owner open the gate. Like I was like, move, like I need to have this thing. I just don't think we have that anymore. I don't no. think that because I think, Oh, that's what I was saying with social media and everything. Everyone's just gotten so used to having everything shoved in their face all day long by all their favorite yeah. artists. But I think the mystery and the, the excitement around an artist has sort of been diffused now. And yeah. I think that because so much music comes out every week and because we're so bombarded with announcements all the time, we don't accept them the same way. I, I've been in the music industry a long time now and I, uh, I've i been through the ringer as well. Um, I've been signed, I've been dropped, I've been signed again, I've been dropped again, I've had labels go out of business on me. Yeah. Like, you know, I feel like I've experienced a lot, um, and I can say that like labels now, they're, they're sort of scrambling because they understand like, well, you know what? I shouldn't say that because there was just that piece that just came out that labels had like their most profitable year in like I don't know how long because yeah. they have a monopoly with Spotify. Yeah, who, in my mind, are becoming an incredible, incredibly evil company that are screwing all the songwriters. Yeah, they just uh, they're suing you. They're suing songwriters for their like for. The uh, the the forty four percent extra royalty like like uh, suing us, but they are like they're appealing against a ruling that is changing a hundred and ten year old law that is allowing us to actually be paid right. normally now like yeah. the way the music has evolved um, and now they filed an totally, antitrust like, already we were already being completely screwed and I think this new deal is just being screwed a little less but the fact that they're appealing it I think they're really shooting themselves in the foot because now all songwriters we're all sort of up in arms about it. Like, what? I don't see how they don't understand that without the songs, they don't have a business. They don't have, they don't have content. They don't have anything. They'll go out of business. All yeah. it takes is for the entire songwriting community to be like, dear Spotify, please remove any song that I've written from your database. Yeah. And they'll go out of business. And I believe, like, last night or this morning, they filed an antitrust against Apple Music it, through the European Union. So... And that may have may or may not. I mean, we'll never know. Be in response to Apple Music, I guess, not joining their, yeah. their this tirade. So do they want to tie up Apple Music while they go after songwriters? Like it really is. It, it's it's not, a. It's, this is not going to end well for them. No. Because again, without our songs, they have no business. Right. So I don't understand. I mean, Amazon is a different story. And yeah. The same. But like yeah. Spotify or a, street, a music streaming service, and if they don't, yeah, if they don't treat us well, we don't have to use them. And you know, I know a lot of friends in the songwriting world who have deleted their Spotify accounts this week. And you know, me pulling my music off Spotify is only going to hurt me. Yeah. Whereas some of Post Malone or or Taylor Swift pulling their music off Spotify actually says something and will cause Spotify damage. Um, they're not worried about little Greg Holden. Well, I mean, I, I personally, obviously, you know, I would be worried if, if I couldn't access that stuff. And I, I, It'll be on sale on iTunes. And I'm, you know, yeah, and, and there's other options for well, sure. So it's not like it won't be accessible. Well, but most people listen to music through Spotify. 
I promised myself I, w- I wanted to talk so much about the record. I just had, to, I just happened to like have this uh, incredible chat with you, and I quickly tell you, like, I made the record on my own in my yes. bedroom in LA. Well, not in my bedroom, my home studio. Um, I popped them on the run, so the whole thing was recorded here at my house. Nice. Uh, and you know, it was a very a difficult and challenging process, but you know, I'm glad that it's done. Uh, and we'll see. I mean. I'm releasing it in a very different time because Chase the Zone came out in 2015 and now this, we're in a very different climate. So. Oh, God, yeah. And what are you, what are you doing for Patties? Uh, I'm playing a Van Morrison tribute night in Los Angeles with a bunch of my friends, actually. Oh, uh, what are you singing? A Brown Eyed Girl. Somehow I got that one. Oh, f- <laughs> of all the songs, really? Yeah, it's, honestly, it's the only one I know. <laughs> oh, okay, I was going to say, but you seem like more of an in, into the mystic guy. I like sang with Van, I sang that song with Van Morrison. I saw the clip, yeah. I saw the clip on, uh, I think on your Instagram. It's really funny. And uh, that must have been, that must have been wild uh, to say the least. Anyway, enjoy St. Patrick's Day. It's uh, one of my favorite days of the year. And next time we touch base, I'll, I'll tell you how our, our version of Hold On Tight with a, uh, with a fiddle player went. Great. All thanks, right, great. Man, I appreciate your time. All the best. Excited for, for uh, World War Me. And uh, thanks again. This is an hour of my favorite interview so far so thank you so much nice to speak to you Jordan yeah thanks a lot Greg take care